My name is Andrew Sardella. I am a public health planner at Region of Waterloo Public Health. And I'm very uh, excited to uh, be moderating today's webinar uh, entitled Familial Hypocholesterolemia in Public Health and Clinical Practice. Um, this webinar is a collaboration between um, APHA Genomics Forum Tier 1 Applications Group and the Workforce Development Group, as well as Genetic Alliance. Um, this webinar is actually part of a, a series of webinars focused on uh, Tier 1 applications. The, um, the first webinar, um, titled Public Health Genomics in Practice, State Strategies, as well as Hereditary Breast and Ovarian Cancer and Lynch Syndrome webinars are all available um, on the Genetic Alliance website. So check those out if you haven't seen those already. Um, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping to start things off. Um, all the participants will be muted. Um, so if you want to ask a question, there is a little chat box um, on the webinar um, panel that you can uh, type into at any time and questions will be answered at the end of the uh, webinar. And then the slides and the recording of this webinar will also be uh, recorded, um, sorry, will also be posted on the Genetic Alliance website uh, afterwards. So I just want to start off by introducing you to our uh, webinar panelists. Uh, we have four great panelists today. Um, start off with uh, Claudia McHale. She is a um, um, doctor at the a physician at the uh, Center for Preventive Care and Genetics in California, as well as an instructor in the Division of Healthy Policy and Management at UCLA. Dr. Joshua Knowles um, uh, works at the Inherited Cardiovascular Disease uh, Center at St Stanford, is also a chief medical advisor uh, for the Familial Hypocholesterolemia Foundation. We have uh, Amy Sturm, a genetic counselor um, in the Division of Human Genetics at Wexner Medical, the Ohio, uh, Ohio State University. And then our last presenter will be Dr. William Neal. Um, he's the founder of uh, the Cardiac Program uh, in West Virginia. So just some of the object objectives we um, will um, go through today are to provide some real life examples of programs that address um, familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH, uh, offer some resources and tools that are available to help facilitate support related to FH, uh, as well as uh, provide some perspectives from uh, a variety of healthcare practitioners and uh, patients on uh, the importance of FH. So to uh, start things off, uh, we will uh, hear from Claudia. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Okay, so the objectives for this segment are going to be defining FH, its genetics and epidemiology, sharing general guidelines for cholesterol screening, introducing how FH is diagnosed and managed, reviewing the concept of cascade screening and its public health implications, and summarizing CDC Tier 1 recommendations. So what is familial hypercholesterolemia? It's a common hereditary form of hyperlipidemia characterized by severely elevated LDL cholesterol levels. Cholesterol levels in FH patients are significantly higher than those typically seen in patients with high cholesterol. FH patients are at substantially increased risk for coronary heart disease at an early age. The disease is caused by one or more mutations in genes that affect LDL levels in the blood. There are two forms of FH, a heterozygous form and a homozygous form. 60 to 80 percent of the heterozygous cases are due to one mutation in one of three genes, LDLR. APOB, and PCSK9, although more genes are being identified. The homozygous form involves two mutations, two in the same gene or one in two different FH genes. In terms of epidemiology, the prevalence of heterozygous FH, which is the more common form, is 1 in 200 to 1 in 500 people. The homozygous form is rarer, but it's more severe and occurs in 1 in 160 to 1 in a million people. Some ethnic groups are at higher risk. 
With regard to morbidity and mortality, if untreated, there's a 20-fold increased risk for CHD, typically presenting as angina or myocardial infarction. In untreated males, there's a 50% risk for a coronary event by age 50, and in untreated females, a 30% risk by age 60. In homozygous FH, morbidity and mortality appears as early as childhood or adolescence, with most patients having advanced DHD by their mid-20s. With regard to burden of disease, about 5% of myocardial infarctions in Americans below age 60 are attributable to FH per year. About 600,000 to 1.2 million children and adults are at risk for preventable vascular events due to FH. Unfortunately, however, only a small percentage of Americans with FH are diagnosed, so they may not receive adequate treatment. The inheritance pattern of FH is autosomal dominant with de novo mutations thought to be very rare. <coughs> this means that practically all FH patients inherited the disease from one of their parents or both of their parents. In homozygous FH, patients transmit FH to all of their offspring. Patients with the heterozygous form have a 50% chance of transmitting FH to each of their children. If both parents have heterozygous FH, there's a 75% chance for each child to have some form of FH, as we can see in the diagram. So this illustrates the power of family history. Once FH is diagnosed in a patient, the likelihood of discovering it in close relatives is very high. So how do we go about detecting FH? The first step is just generally detecting hypercholesterolemia in individual patients. We already have guidelines for that. The USP STF currently recommends screening men age 35 or older for lipid disorders and screening men and women age 20 and up for lipid disorders if they're at increased risk for coronary heart disease, for example, if they have a family history of premature heart disease. Should kids be screened for hypercholesterolemia? Yes, the AAP recommends that if there's a family history of heart disease in men before age 55 or in women before age 65, children in that family should undergo cholesterol testing as early as age 2 and before age 10. The NHLBI and the AAP recommend universal cholesterol testing for all children between the ages of 9 and 11 and again between the ages of 17 and 21. So once we've done generalized hypercholesterol screening, what's the next step? It's recognizing and diagnosing probable FH cases. And there are several red flags to look for. Number one is family history of premature CHD. Next are some physical signs suggestive of FH, such as xanthomas, xanthelasmas, and corneal arcus, which um, Dr. Knowles will be showing us examples of later in the webinar. And when we do a lipid panel, we can also um, see results that are indicative of a high likelihood of FH. For example, in adults with LDL cholesterol greater than 190 or total cholesterol greater than 310, we would suspect FH. In children or adolescents with LDL over 160 or total cholesterol over 230, again, we'd suspect FH. Finally, the presence of an FH mutation would be confirmatory. So why distinguish between FH and non-FH hypercholesterolemia? That's because treatment for FH needs to be more aggressive. The lifestyle changes that we use as first-line therapy, quote-unquote, for non-FH hypercholesterolemia are usually not adequate for FH hypercholesterolemia. Pharmacotherapy plays a much stronger role in FH cases. In cases of homozygous FH, you might even require LDL apheresis or liver transplant to control the disease. So once we've diagnosed FH in an individual patient, is our job done? Not from a genetic standpoint. Like other hereditary disorders, we need to start thinking about potentially affected family members. Identifying an index case leads us to additional possible cases giving us the opportunity to prevent CHD in more patients through early detection and treatment. This is the rationale behind cascade screening for FH. 
We've also recognized multiple public health benefits of cascade screening for this disease. We know that heart disease is the number one leading cause of death in America, with over 600,000 um, uh, deaths per year due to that. And we found that um, cascade screening for FH is a cost-effective method for CHD prevention. We've also seen much evidence of reduced morbidity and mortality of FH with treatment. By targeting individuals with high risk for high cholesterol and CHD, cascade screening supports several Healthy People 2020 objectives, such as reducing coronary heart disease deaths, increasing the proportion of adults who have had their blood cholesterol checked within the preceding five years, reducing the proportion of adults with high blood cholesterol levels, and reducing the mean total blood cholesterol levels among adults. So NICE and CDC Tier 1 recommendations offer an approach for cascade screening. Once FH has been diagnosed in an index case, cascade testing of relatives is recommended to identify affected family members. Healthcare professionals should offer all patients with FH a referral to a specialist for confirmation of diagnosis and initiation of cascade testing. Healthcare professionals with expertise in FH should explain cascade testing and its implications to all FH patients. Cascade testing using a combination of DNA testing and LDL levels is recommended to identify affected family, member, family members, including first, second, and if possible, third degree relatives of the index case. In families with a known mutation, the mutation and not LDL levels should be used to identify affected relatives. In the absence of a DNA diagnosis, cascade testing using LDL levels should be undertaken. The use of a nationwide family-based follow-up system is recommended to enable comprehensive identification of people affected by FH. Healthcare professionals should be aware of the latest guidance on data protection when undertaking cascade testing. So obviously privacy and confidentiality remain important. So what have states done to date? We've taken big steps and little steps toward increasing FH awareness and identification. In West Virginia, the cardiac FH program has been very active, and we'll hear a little bit more detail about that in the webinar today. In Connecticut in 2013, the Department of Public Health added questions relating to FH to their behavioral risk factor surveillance system. So the question I'll leave you with today is how might we implement similar initiatives in other states. The next, segment of, the next segments of this webinar will provide further insights with more details on clinical diagnosis and management of FH, genetic counseling perspectives, and West Virginia's FH program with emphasis on pediatrics. So I'll, um, I'm going to um, pass the baton to our next speaker. I believe we have a short video we'll be showing as well. You know, it's almost like having a loaded gun pointed at your chest all the time, and you just don't know when it's going to go off. They say uh, people with familial hypercholesterolemia, by the time they're adult, your cardiovascular system is about 30 years older than you are. So if I think to myself, okay, I'm a 46-year-old guy, but if I have a cardiovascular system of a 76-year-old man, then that kind of makes sense as far as, you know, why I'm having these issues. One of the reasons why FH is a silent killer is because typically people with FH look fine, normal, healthy, and you never realize that you have some serious condition going on inside your cardiovascular system um, until most people have a cardiac event. When I was uh, 43, I was working out in the gym, started having chest pains on an elliptical machine. The cardiologist, she was telling me, uh, I'm sorry, but we're gonna have to do a bypass on you. When they got in there, they ended up doing a quadruple bypass. 
from the age of 27, when I was uh, discovered my high cholesterol, I thought I was doing everything possible to prevent being in that situation. I was taking my statins, I was working out, I was watching my diet, and I had low cholesterol to prove it. And so who has homework? You do? Okay, how about girls? Why don't we start getting dinner ready and then Luke can start his homework. What do you think I'm gonna eat for dinner? Spinach. Spinach. <laughs> this is part of my, uh, my vegan diet, huh? You know, when you talk about cholesterol and FH, one of the first things that pops up is diet. Specifically, what I'm very focused on is to see how low I can get my LDL. And so I've decided to try a no oil vegan diet. I'm basically eating, you know, spinach, oatmeal, and, uh, and beans. And so that's kind of the extent of the diet. So it's, uh, it's pretty challenging, but um, you know, I, I can certainly handle it for six weeks is what I'm trying it for. I've got a, a blood test coming up. My goal is 70. And there's even been a couple studies that say if you get under 70 uh, LDL, you can actually have some heart disease reversal. All right, so what do you what do y'all want for dinner tonight? Pizza. Pizza? Okay. Which one do you think we should use? Well let's let's see what the ingredients say. How many grams of fat is in there? Okay, this is 3.52. That's not bad. And then Chloe, do you know remember how many grams of fat you can have a day? 28. 28, that's right. So after I had my bypass surgery, someone suggested to me that I have my kids tested, and so I did. And uh, what I discovered is they all three have high cholesterol, and they have the familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, before we found out really about FH and how significant it was from a diet perspective, we um, would you know, order Domino's Pizza, Papa John's. So what we've done is we've actually recreated that in a, uh, a low-fat, um, non-greasy form. What I found is two of my children had a high cholesterol profile similar to mine in the 300 range. Okay. But then I also found that one of my children uh, received the double defect, which is called homozygous uh, FH. And her cholesterol was in the 900s. I was kind of thinking I would have to eat super, super healthy and um, work out every single day, but then I realized that we could just take medicine for it and I made it a little less to worry about. And then thinking in the future they'll have even better medicine that can just make it even easier. You know, for us, statins are like daily vitamins. Yeah. And that's just kind of part of our life. After my bypass surgery, they discovered that this carotid was 70% blocked and this was 50% blocked. Over the course of the next year, I went back and this one was 90% blocked. And how do we know whose is whose? They quickly scheduled me for surgery on the carotid artery in which they went in and removed the blockage. But he basically said that it was, there was so little blood flow that he could barely get the shunt in. I had a post-surgery stress test and what they found is that there's some more problems with my heart. Two of the four bypass grafts have failed the doctor saying, you know, we're going to have to redo your bypass because of these issues, and it's going to be a higher risk procedure this time. The thought of having to have, do that again is pretty challenging. And then go, and you just kind of drop it into, into where you're going to hit it. Oh! One of my biggest concerns is if something, you know, should happen to me and I'm not around, uh, will my kids continue on with their treatment? So I will hope to share some information about what um, patients and families really go through with the diagnosis of FH and, and how they think about communicating within families and, and how genetic counselors and other healthcare professionals can really help um, the cascade testing process along. I, I really like to start off with this quote because I think that Paul Hopkins here in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology just really um, drives home the point of how important it is for us to really begin to think about 
ways that we can systematically identify patients with FH and why it's so important. And then even though we've done so much um, fantastic research in different genome type studies, we still have this extremely common disease um, where he says FH provides the only example of a genetic cause of premature coronary artery disease for which a systematic population-based approach to find affected individuals and screen their families is clearly warranted at this time. So I hope that, you know, what we're doing today during this webinar will definitely convince you of this. Again, to touch on cascade screening, um, I wanted to show a pedigree and show that in the clinic what we definitely need to do for every single index patient we see with FH is draw out at least a three if not larger generation pedigree so that we can begin to see who these at-risk individuals in their family would be. And so again, with cascade screening, the whole entire point of this is once you have diagnosed your index patient, and here we have the arrow pointing to the index patient, this 48-year-old male with FH, what we really need to do is this systematic process of family tracing to identify, hopefully, every single other at-risk um, relative who then can be diagnosed with FH in their family. And we want to be smart about using our resources, so if at all possible, it's best to move out to first-degree relatives. Those first-degree relatives who then are diagnosed will give us other individuals that we need to screen for FH as well. And the whole goal is just to do this in a systematic cascade stepwise process throughout the entire family until every person, including pa pediatric patients again, um, are diagnosed with FH in the families. We do know that if DNA testing has been done in families and the mutation has been identified, this really has been shown to be the best and most cost-effective and most accurate way to um, clarify those individuals who do have FH for those from those family members who do not. Newly identified cases, again, provide more relatives who should be screened, and really, of course, with the whole goal of facilitating early detection and treatment of this condition where, again, you have lifelong exposure to high LDL cholesterol levels. And again, multiple studies in different countries have shown that this is indeed a cost-effective way of identifying individuals with FH. We did want to share a little bit more details about the Dutch experience in the Netherlands, and, and you'll recall the slide that Dr. Knowles showed with the United States having identified at least far less than 10% of their patients with FH, but how the Netherlands had really just done a fantastic job, and we kind of looked to them, of course, of a model program for what they were able to do with a national lipid and genetic cascade screening program that they did run nationally in their country um, that was started in 1994. Now, now, of course, we know that their country is different from other countries, um, but this did show some things that were um, very positive and able to work and were very effective. It did include home visits using what they called their genetic field nurses and genetic field workers, and they had been able to identify well over 20,000 individuals with FH. And on top of this, they, they did cascade screening. And so in the first five years alone of their program, by screening over 5,000 relatives of about 200-some index patients, they identified over 2,000 carriers. And what is really even more phenomenal is that initially, when, when they looked at these individuals who are identified, um, many were on medication, almost 40%. But two years after the molecular diagnosis, um, it was double that number, actually more than double that number, that then were on therapy and at least being treated um, for their FH when before they were not. And again, here just showing how this was shown to be cost effective for their program. So, you know, in thinking about what can we do now, with, without really um, a solid national program in place currently, um, that doesn't mean we can't do anything. And so what can we start with to best commence with doing some cascade testing um, to start making some progress? And it has been suggested that beginning with pilot projects, of course, local initiatives where we can begin to gather some pilot data and learn what works and what may not work um, in this country and others could be a good start. 
uh, one challenge, of course, that we have is that closely related family members typically do not share the same health care provider, and they may not all be in the same practice um, for that same health care provider to test all of the first and then second and, and extended relatives. And so I think we need to think about some creative and innovative ways that we can really push this forward in more of a systematic way. And in thinking about that, we need to think about what is the best way to inform at-risk relatives. There's a lot of discussion about proband contact versus direct contact of relatives, perhaps with permission, um, by a healthcare provider. And there are pros and cons to both methods, and it's also been suggested that maybe a combined method might be best, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. It's very important, again, to get a standardized pedigree on the patient which can help clarify um, very immediately and visually who is at risk in these families. And storage of this information in the electronic medical record and being able to share this hopefully between institutions would definitely be a goal. Genetic counseling can hopefully have an impact with these families where they go through the genetic counseling process. And, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about what should be included in that genetic counseling process. And we've also been able to develop tools, things like dear family member letters and emails that could be utilized by index cases by index cases to help them get this ball rolling um, with communication to their family. So um, Newsom and Humphreys, um, actually back um, 10 years ago now, really went through and thought about uh, these differences and compared what may work when we're talking about how to reach out to these at-risk relatives in families with FH. And, and both when we look at proband initiated family contact and comparing that to direct contact of relatives, um, say by a healthcare provider or by some type of systems approach, maybe a public health approach or a program approach, there are pros and cons to both. But to think about a little bit this, um, you know, draw your attention first to the left hand side of the slide. Uh, you know, proband initiated is really the standard practice we do in our clinical genetics practices. We do have a solid discussion with that proband and really ask them to share and communicate the information to all of their at-risk family members. And of course, this protects confidentiality and allows them to share information that they feel comfortable sharing. Um, and perhaps their relatives may be at less risk of any potential psychological harm due to unsolicited contact. However, we also know that this may lead toward lower response rates of family members being screened. Um, it's also been shown that relatives who receive information from a proban that might just have less impact um, and it's less authoritative than if it were to come from an actual health professional who is a knowledgeable expert in that area. Probians may also just never contact their relatives. They are dealing with their own new diagnosis a lot of the times and worrying about even getting their own treatment, um, you know, where it needs to be. And so this may not be top priority right when they're getting diagnosed. Um, we also know that they could potentially provide incorrect information to relatives as well. And so in thinking about what could we possibly do with direct contact, um, of course we need to figure out the best ways to gain consent um, to be able to share information information from probands um, regarding their diagnosis and figuring out what could be feasible um, for direct outreach to our at-risk relatives. Um, again, thinking about some of these privacy and confidentiality um, issues we talked about earlier. There, there may be potential for psychological harm, but most studies that have done active outreach programs have not shown a high percentage of this in the at-risk relatives they did indeed reach out to. It, it, in a way, takes away the right to know, but again, you're not necessarily reaching out and telling a person they have FH. You're more reaching out and telling them that they have a chance that they could have FH. Um, is there a potential for actual harm? And, and one of the things that's brought up is the potential for life insurance discrimination if you're reaching out and informing people of this. Um, but overall, it's been shown that this is likely of minimal risk. Uh, perhaps there could be a, an impact, of course, on family dynamics, which this is why we really do think an individualized communication pattern, um, talking about with the probian what they think might work best within their own particular family and really tailoring and customizing that. But we also know, again, that with efficiency and with direct outreach and, and systematizing this, we may be able to directly outreach more to a higher number of relatives and getting that information into the hands of more people. And, 
and another positive th of this methodology is that you're taking that burden off the shoulders of the probands, um, and so they don't have to necessarily be the one to share that message. They might be a partner in, in doing that, but they don't have that entire onus on them to do that. This is an interesting study that did interview and performed um, a thematic analysis of patients who do indeed have a genetic diagnosis of FH, and it was really trying to get at, you know, what was keeping relatives from coming in to learning about the risk that they may have for FH, and there were many factors at play, um, including uh, maybe just not wanting to know or maybe initial denial, for whatever reason, a lower or lack of motivation, but also the perception that FH is just not that serious, which we know to not be the case, and so getting across that message that indeed it is serious the absolute necessity for adherence to medication and possible multiple medications, again, and really getting that treatment underway, um, likely uh, with, with the goal um, having to use multiple medications is a big message that these families need to understand. And it was also very interesting, um, playing off what I said in the previous slide, many people just did not feel that they were authoritative enough or that their family members looked at them as an authoritative figure on this topic to be able to persuade or motivate them to come in for screening. And so they did indeed welcome assistance from the hospital team, from healthcare providers to help them um, with this process of communication to lead toward cascade screening. To touch a little bit on genetic testing, again, the major gene involved with um, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia is the LDL receptor gene. And there are um, other genes involved uh, that are a little bit, uh, you know, of course, not as common causes. But we do know that overall, um, even with definite uh, diagnoses of FH, the clinical sensitivity of FH genetic testing is not 100%. It reaches maybe as high as 80% in definite cases, but um, there are still other unknown as yet to be discovered causes um, for FH. But genetic testing can indeed be uh, beneficial with the diagnosis because we do know that there can be a broad spectrum of cholesterol levels. And so you can see here, um, you see in turquoise the quote unquote normal individuals who do not have any form of FH. In yellow, you can see there with the bell-shaped curve just the spectrum of different types of levels that you may see in patients with heterozygous FH. And then of course the spectrum with homozygous too, depending on the severity of the mutations. And so if you can indeed perform genetic testing to clinch uh, the diagnosis, uh, that of course is the gold standard. Um, but, you know, where really are we with genetic testing, and especially looking here in the United States? And we know that while genetic testing and finding a pathogenic disease causing mutation in one of these genes does provide an unequivocal diagnosis, genetic testing for this condition has not been as systematically incorporated or endorsed as it has been for the other Tier 1 conditions. Um, that being said, it is available via many different commercial genetic testing laboratories, and I think some other laboratories will be developing um, genetic testing for FH because they do see it as important and, of course, in this Tier 1 category. And you can find the laboratories offering this testing in the NIH Genetic Testing Registry and Gene Tests. But there's not necessarily a U.S.-specific guideline recommending genetic testing in every case of FH. So what do the guidelines say? Um, you have this nice summary slide here for you with all types of different guidelines and citations, but you can see um, that many of the guidelines do indeed recommend um, providing genetic testing to all index cases who have a phenotype diagnosis of FH. And on top of that, um, you know, if the gene mutation has been identified, using it for cascade testing and also in the context of genetic counseling. So what should genetic counseling for FH include? Um, it should really include all of these points in a detailed conversation with the patient, with the family, of course touching on the inheritance pattern. Many patients and, and actually many providers may not necessarily even know that this is indeed a hereditary autosomal dominant condition and the heterozygous form with a 50-50 risk to all first degree relatives. Always of course need to cover cascade screening, again including pediatric patients. We can talk about genetic testing, many other points. Um, um, and also provide a lot of resources, some of the things that we've already shown, as well as our Dear Family Member letter. 
the Dear Family Member letter that has been put together by the National Society of Genetic Counselors can be located both on that website as well as on the FH Foundation's website as a resource. And it's a great tool that you can give to all of your index cases and ask them to share this. Um, any format with their relatives, and it gives a lot of information about what is FH, what they need to do um, as a next step, which is as simple as taking this letter and showing it to their doctor and getting a lipid panel um, as a first step, and also it touches on the inheritance pattern, and there's actually a page two of this that goes into more details about resources. And so, just again, um, I wanted to close with another favorite quote, and I think that it's just imperative for all of us to think about this, and that if these relatives are not informed of their risk for FH, um, they still will be at very high risk of developing CHD, um, even if they're not informed. So we really need to take this opportunity to, to inform them and reduce that risk. Um, these are some additional resources that we wanted to provide you with the FH Foundation that does have a Find an FH Specialist map. You can find um, local partners. The National Lipid Association has a similar tool, Find a Lipid Specialist, on their website. Um, PCNA, or the Preventive Cardiovascular Nurses Association, has some very nice patient-friendly handouts on FH. Um, and then again, here, if you'd like to find um, both that Dear Family Member letter and also a letter of medical necessity to help getting FH genetic testing covered by by a patient's um, health insurance, we have that tool that has been developed as well. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Amy. Um, provided a lot of great tools and resources that I think uh, can be used by providers and agencies as well. Um, I just want to remind uh, any of the participants that if they do have questions, that you can type them into the uh, text box at any time. Um, I uh, want to thank Amy again for talk, touching on the nuances of uh, cascade testing as well as uh, genetic testing. Uh, and she mentioned uh, the Dutch experience, um, but uh, we're going to talk about a, a local program here and hear from Dr. Neil. Dr. Neil, go ahead. Yes, um, um, I'm going to talk primarily, uh, if not exclusively, about uh, the pediatric perspective, which has been alluded to by some of our other <laughs> presenters. And uh, our interest at West Virginia University began with FH uh, in response to a, um, an RFA by CDC in uh, 1998 in which uh, they <coughs> were requesting uh, grant applications to be entitled Addressing Familial Hypercholesterolemia, a model program for states. We applied for that uh, and, and the grant was awarded uh, for two years. Uh, and so it is curious that uh, though we know that so many, the vast majority of people who have FH uh, do not know about it, and, and it's only been in the last uh, one to two years that there's been a, uh, such a resurgence of interest in this uh, condition. Uh, nevertheless, CDC was aware of it back uh, in the late 1990s, and uh, of course the wonderful work of Roger Williams from Utah uh, was beginning to inform all of us uh, about it. So we approached it in West Virginia from a childhood perspective by forming what is referred to as, West, as the West Virginia Cardiac Project, which stands for Coronary Artery Risk Detection in Appalachian Communities. And the overall goal was to reduce cardiovascular disease in our state. And what that consists of is school-based, offering free school-based screening for risk factors for, we say, heart disease and diabetes, because as you'll see, it's not, it's not just a lipid profile. But uh, there are about 20,000 fifth grade school children uh, each year, and uh, we offer this screening. Uh, there's about a 50 percent, uh, about 50 percent of the of the families do uh, provide active consent uh, for their child to participate. Uh, the results of the screening are sent home to the parents, and a lot of our work does have to do with interventional strategies, both from a, and a public health model of population based as well as the high-risk individualized, and obviously our FH component uh, does represent the high-risk individualized approach, whereas the population approach uh, has more to do with lifestyle modification. So there are 55 counties in West Virginia. We began in 1998 screening in, uh, in three of our counties, and each year doubled the counties that, particip that participated so that by 2003 all 55 counties uh, have participated. 
what happens in the school setting is that uh, we measure height and weight, in which you could calculate body mass index. We measure blood pressure. The, the uh, uh, folks, uh, the workers, can look at the back of the neck in particular for the rash of acanthosis nigricans as an indicator of possible insulin resistance when that's present. In addition to passing up the profile, we also measure blood cholesterol. Uh, we also measure glucose and insulin so that we can do a HOMA index to calculate insulin resistance. Also, if parents happen to be there or school personnel will, will screen them free as well uh, on that day. So of uh, uh, 95,000 students who have been screened thus far since 1998, you'll see that nearly half are at least overweight and not frankly obese. And <clears throat> that's obviously a major problem, not only in our state, but nationwide. Uh, but uh, certainly occupies a lot of attention. And the prevalence of hypertension is very much related to weight status. Uh, it's almost exclusively found in the children that are overweight or obese. You'll see in this figure that a little over 5% of the uh, children had LDL levels greater than 130. And 5% of students had uh, the rash acanthosis. And of those, nearly half had documented hyperinsulinemia. The overall goal, of course, of this offering this mass uh, and universal cholesterol screening was, in fact, to identify children as probands for probable FH. And this is what uh, uh, this this is based on an N of 60,000 students in which there was complete fasting lipid profile data, and you'll see that uh, a little over one percent had LDLs greater than 160. Um, about 0.2% LDLs greater than 190, and an in-between point of 0.4%, or about 1 in 200 uh, children with LDLs greater than 175. So we know that uh, when the LDL is greater than 160, uh, particularly if there's a positive family history of premature heart disease, we pediatricians take that quite seriously and consider at least uh, cholesterol-lowering medication if the child is at least eight years of age. Uh, and uh, has not responded to lifestyle uh, modification. Now, I will say that at this level of 160, uh, occasionally putting the child on a really good diet if they were on a very adverse or poor diet and trying to uh, get them in better physical activity programs and so forth, they might be able to drop their LDL from 160 down to 145 and therefore get to a point where they're not really qualified uh, or, or meeting standards for, uh, for cholesterol-lowering medication. But when you get up around LDLs, uh, certainly above 190, but even in the 175 range, as uh, Dr. Knowles has pointed out, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be able to uh, lower your cholesterol level sufficiently uh, from lifestyle modification to uh, avoid cholesterol medication, cholesterol lowering medication. Just a, a little graph here to show that uh, risk factors for heart disease do, uh, in fact, uh, uh, cluster, and uh, you'll see that the odds ratio for uh, elevated total cholesterol is just about two, slightly above two, whereas for low HDL is significantly higher. <clears throat> this this uh, table I think is particularly important, and what I want to uh, now because it, it, it speaks to a, a, a big uh, controversy and confusion regarding the relationship between obesity and high cholesterol. And uh, when, our, uh, when our data, as I'll show in a moment, uh, showed that uh, people with, uh, th that all children should be uh, offered screening for, uh, uh, for lipids in contrast to just those that have a positive family history, um, the concern was, and, and the media and so forth, was, okay, now, now what's going to happen is that all kinds of children most children are going to end up on cholesterol-lowering medication because of the obesity epidemic and so forth. And as we know, um, statins are not uh, a treatment for obesity. And what you'll see when you go from uh, these categories of normal weight to overweight to obese and then morbidly obese, which is the, the worst 1% in terms of obesity, your, your LDL level, it goes up about twice or twofold once you go from normal to overweight. But it sort of hovers around that uh, odds ratio of two, uh, even when you get more obese. Just meaning, the, once you become a little bit overweight, uh, 
becoming more and more overweight and even morbidly obese does not increase the probability of high cholesterol, uh, which is just another way of saying that what controls our cholesterol at any given time is primarily genetic, primarily molecular, and not lifestyle. In contrast to looking at blood pressure, high triglycerides, uh, presence of acanthosis, low HDL, the more overweight the patient becomes, the more likely they are to have signs and symptoms of metabolic syndrome or prediabetes, if you will. So uh, we, did, we did look after we had screened 20,000 children, and the guidelines at that time still recommended selective uh, screening. We looked retrospectively, retrospectively at these 20,000 children and showed that basically uh, over a third of those who did not fulfill guidelines for cholesterol screening because they did not have a positive family history nevertheless had significant elevation of LDL cholesterol, which was defined as an LDL greater than 160. So we would have missed actually 37% of people, of children who should be considered for cholesterol lowering medication. This is a familial disease as we all know, and, and why, why did we have this finding? And I think it's because there now are so many families in our society in which uh, complete family history is unknown and sometimes no family history whatsoever known on one side of the family, often the fathers. So uh, that's why it, uh, it, it was important, and this was the biggest data set that the Academy of Pediatrics had to work with and resulted in changing the guidelines to universal screening. Uh, I'll end on one positive note that, uh, <clears throat> that we have seen over the course of time because we've not, frankly, seen a, uh, a big decrease in our obesity level in our state uh, despite a lot of attempts at lifestyle modification, uh, but what we have seen is a significant decline in uh, non-HDL cholesterol or LDL cholesterol over the past decade, a 10 milligram drop, which is uh, quite meaningful, probably having to do with um, a significant improvement in the uh, school meal programs which are offered now as compared to 10 or 15 years ago, perhaps uh, taking trans fats out of the diet. Um, so that is at least a hopeful sign when you look at the population as a whole going forward 20 or 30 years. So that ends my presentation, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Neal. I think that was a fantastic example of how um, how FH can fits into you know the larger picture of a chronic disease prevention programs. Um, so I just want to end by thanking all our speakers, um, as well as the Genetic Alliance and uh, the APHA Genomics Forum. We have a couple of questions. I know we're over time, um, so I understand uh, people have to go. But if um, there are a few minutes, we'll go over a couple of questions that we we have from participants. Um, one of them is um, uh, with the clinical diagno diagnostics. Um, when it occurs, there's already a, a large uh, amount of accumulation. Um, and if the identification of FH is meant to be preventive, uh, preventative, are there steps being taken to increase early diagnosis uh, through clinical examination? And is the blood test for FH very expensive? So it, it sounds like a question of, um, you know, really trying to identify these uh, individuals as early as possible. Um, Claudia, do you want to uh, speak to this? Because uh, you ran over some of the uh, the guidelines that are out there. Um, sure. Well, in terms of early diagnosis, I think um, the fact that we're encouraging pediatric screening at an early age, especially in patients with family history, um, that we're going to hopefully pick up those cases early on, and with cascade screening, that should um, improve as well. Um, and so we can start taking, you know, earlier actions um, through the effects of the screening. Um, is there any further follow-up question to that? Um, no. Uh, well, is the blood test for FH very expensive? Okay, well, again, our initial lipid panel would be the LDL and total cholesterol that would be indicative. Um, in terms of the cost of the genetic test, to, as confirmation, maybe Amy or Dr. Knowles would have information on that. Yeah, I can comment um, on the genetic testing specifically. Um, for genetic testing, it, it's really a range, and there are multiple different ways you can proceed. Um, 
some individuals may want to proceed with, for example, doing a stepwise process where you can sequence the LDL receptor first and see if you find a mutation, and if you do, uh, potentially stop and, and not go on to the other genes unless you need to. Um, other laboratories offer more comprehensive evaluations looking at all genes at the same time. And that initial panel can range um, from around maybe less than a thousand to a couple thousand dollars, uh, depending on how the laboratory has built that test and what they actually bill insurance versus uh, what they might bill to a patient. And then once the mutation has been identified in a family, genetic testing becomes much more cost effective on the order of a couple hundred dollars to test for one specific genetic mutation versus doing the full panel of the multiple different genes associated with FH. Great. And our other question here, um, Amy, you might be able to answer this as well, is are the ACMG or the NSGC working on um, some guidelines for FH cascade testing? Um, as far as cascade testing guidelines, not to the best of my knowledge. I do believe um, that for the ACMG document on exome sequencing about incidental findings that should be reported, FH is indeed um, one of those conditions where the genes associated with FH, if a mutation is found, it's recommended that that information be disclosed to the person who had undergone that uh, type of genetic sequencing. Um, I think that we really, you know, there's a lot of individuals that I've spoken to who are very interested in thinking about cascade screening and, and hoping to initiate um, even some pilot projects or some, some ways to think about really more systematizing this um, instead of kind of having that more passive approach that we have typically had with our probands when it comes to recommendations for family cascade testing. Uh, but no formal guidelines at this point that I'm aware of. Great. And we just had one more question come in. How will U.S. doctors position the PCSK9 inhibitors versus uh, lomidopede and mypomersin for uh, homozygous FH patients? Dr. Knowles, is that something you might be able to speak to? Um, we got an email from Dr. Knowles that he had to leave the call. Okay. Uh, anybody else know, um, want to field this one? We might um, just follow up with Dr. Knowles afterwards and, and see if we can get an answer to that and add it as well. Um, I guess I will wrap things up. I want to thank um, all the, uh, the speakers again, um, as well as all the participants for um, for attending, and I hope you gain a lot from this, and um, we have some better ideas of how to integrate uh, FH into public health and public health programs going forward. Thank you, and we'll uh, close the webinar now.